name is Megan West, um, and I am, as Hope said, the digital CRM manager and recipe strategist at ConAgra. Um, I am not a social media person, so disclaimer. Um, I, that's actually one of the reasons I love Pinterest, um, because I feel like it's a little bit more like search engine marketing, just with pictures. Um, and I, I feel like we can prove that it works for us, and I'm going to talk to you today about some of that success. So. Who is ConAgra Food? Some of you may not know, um, but we actually have brands in 99% of homes. Um, hopefully you recognize at least one of the brands up here. Uh, and I'm really lucky because my job is a recipe strategist. And, and what that really means, we kind of made up the title. I don't know if other people have this job at other um, large CPG companies. Um, but, but my job is really to be the marketing liaison with our culinary team. So we've got three folks um, in our Naperville test kitchen that are specifically devoted to developing recipes. Uh, and my job is to make sure that they're given uh, a strategic brief and that there's a clear business reason for us to be developing those recipes. Um, so I kind of act as that liaison between our brand teams and our culinary team. And I also manage uh, Ready, Set, Eat, which is our CRM program. So just a quick word about Ready, Set, Eat. Um, this is a relatively new program, and we are laser focused on the idea of solving the weeknight dinner dilemma for, for consumers. So 60% of dinner ideas are actually come up with on the day of, so 60% of people don't really know what they're going to make for dinner later that night, and so our focus is to come up with recipes for them um, that make that baby simple for them to figure out. So uh, all of our recipes are seven ingredients or less, they're all 30 minutes or less, and they're all professionally developed to make sure that moms and dads can really feel good about trying a new recipe out. Um, we are actually a relatively new brand. We're three years old um, as of this January, uh, and we have started from scratch. We've, we've seen a great, great deal of growth, about 140% year-over-year growth in terms of ROI, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and we've actually uh, dug deep into SEO, so we're getting a lot of great SEO wins in the top five on Google on dinner ideas, easy chicken recipes, easy dinner recipes. Um, and even though we're competing with a lot bigger players, we're getting almost 44% of our traffic from organic search. Um, and, and I'll tell you why that matters to Pinterest in, in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about Pinterest. Um, so how many of you guys have had a client or an executive come up and say, oh, what's my Instagram strategy? Or maybe we should be using more QR codes. Or why aren't we on Pinterest? Um, does that sound familiar a little bit? Um, well, hopefully, hopefully you guys know that that's not quite the right question to start with. We really should be starting with not tactics, not channels, um, but our business objectives. Selling stuff is the reason that we all have jobs. So we really need to start from the top down. Uh, why should you listen to me about Pinterest? ConAgra Foods, Ready, Set, Eat, we don't have the most Pinterest followers. Uh, probably none of you guys do, except maybe Dana from Kraft. She might actually have the most Pinterest followers. Um, but we're actually, um, uh, the, the reason is because we're so laser focused on business objectives. Um, we are a volume driven organization. Every dollar we spend, every dollar I spend is scrutinized almost all the way up to the CEO level in terms of what it did for our sales. What was the ROI? How did this impact volume? Um, so we can't necessarily go out and just test a whole bunch of new social channels until we figure out which one works and sort of say, yeah, we got some engagement and some impressions. We really don't have any idea what that did for our actual sales. Um, so for us, we use a strategic framework called an OGSM. A lot of you may be familiar with that. Um, and I'll just go through a really simple explanation of that. I promise I will get to Pinterest. It all, it all will make sense eventually. Um, I told you I'm not a social media person. Um, so, so let's talk about an OGSM. And this is really something that all of you guys can do. You can do it for any um, discipline. You can do it for any brand, big or small. And what it is is it allows you to make strategic choices. So it's helping you choose what you should be doing and also what you shouldn't be doing. Um, and it's a great exercise to go through with your team and then socialize it uh, across your company that says, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so we want to start with our objective. What do we want to achieve? Um, well, for us, that's driving incremental sales of, of ConAgra Foods brand. So every recipe has branded ingredients, and we can tie that back to sales, which I'll talk about in a minute. So our goal then. So objective is words, goals is numbers, so how much? And we have an objective, a percentage lift that we want to drive incremental sales with just ready, set, eat for ConAgra Foods. 
Strategy, how will we choose to get there? And this is where we can make a series of choices about what we're going to do to drive against that objective. And for us, that's providing users with quick and easy dinner ideas to solve the weeknight dinner dilemma. And then we have to have a measure, so how will we know when we get there? And for us, that's recipe visits. So we want to say drive X number of recipe visits to recipe pages, and then we pick out our tactics. So finally, after we've gone through that series of choices, then we can finally start to say, what are the tactics that will help us drive in these number of visits and therefore drive sales? For us, that's search engine marketing, content discovery like Taboola and Outbrain, and, and relatively newly, Pinterest. Um, we are also seeing that Pinterest is the number one referring site um, after SEO to our, uh, to our websites, and so we're really trying to capitalize on that. So how do we know that recipe visits are going to drive sales? That's a big question. What is my ROI? Um, well, we've partnered with Nielsen to do a study that actually takes a look at the impact of a visitor to our site. And what that does is it says control versus exposed are people who visit your website buying more products than people who don't. And it's that simple. And we now have an actual incremental sales lift for every single visit to the site. And from there, we can calculate an ROI based on our spend. Um, hopefully, that is smaller than the amount of sales we're getting positive ROI. And how do we know Pinterest is going to drive recipe visits? Um, the infographics say that they will. So um, <laughs> you guys can just Google that later if you want to. So now I'm going to get into three Pinterest case studies. Um, I, I thought I had a little bit longer today, so I'm going to go through these pretty fast because there's actually a second half to this presentation that I think is a little bit more interactive, more interesting. These slides will be shared on SlideShare if you want to dive in deeper. So we're going to talk about sweepstakes, Pinfluencer campaigns and organic pin management. So sweepstakes, and you guys just heard from Threadless um, a little bit about a Pinterest sweepstakes. We did test one out about two years ago when we were first starting our Pinterest presence, uh, and, and we asked people to you know pin it to win it, pin our content in order to chance to win. It worked pretty well. It drove a lot of traffic, um, but actually, a lot like Shanna said, what we found is that the quality of person that was coming to the site wasn't very high. So they they click. They'd come to the site once, and then the, the drop-off rate um, and the repeat rate was extremely low. Um, so in terms of contest, I think these can be really good for starting a Pinterest presence, for driving awareness of content, because it's a little bit more about pinning versus, uh, versus visiting the site. Uh, the watchouts are really that Pinterest is cracking down on regulation. You do have to disclose that each person is involved in a contest. And it could not be the quality of visitor that you want. Pinfluencer campaigns. So, we recently partnered with uh, a company called Hello Society, and there's a lot of different partners out there that you can look to. And, and what we asked them to do was they, they have a set of 150 of the most influential pinners. A lot of them are bloggers uh, on Pinterest. And so we, they, they ask those bloggers to pin our content in order to drive some excitement around it. And, and what we saw is this was, this was pretty successful for us. We saw a 10x average increase in traffic from Pinterest to our site in that it was actually a 24-hour period. We didn't really know how long it would, how long it would go because we paid for a certain amount of, of traffic. Uh, it was over in 24 hours. Great success. However, I feel like that it, it probably is better used when you um, have a campaign-focused activity if you're partnering with other marketing channels, trying to make a big splash around a specific initiative versus a long-term uh, Pinterest strategy to get, get going. Uh, and also, you know, you may not have time to optimize your content. There's really not a lot of time for testing and learning when it goes by like that. Our third case study is about organic pin management. So this is something where we're partnering with a, a company called Ahology. Um, they used to be called PinGage. They've gone through some name changes. And essentially, they're really just uh, community managers for, for Pinterest for us. So they pin the right content at the right time, and then they use analytics to optimize that. And we've seen a ton of success with these guys. Um, and, and you really could repeat this without, without that. Um, third party, if you have internal community managers that can devote the time to really learning and setting up your strategy. Uh, we've seen a, a major increase in traffic. And we've also uh, been able to create a playbook, which has been great. Um, so they helped us create our Pinterest playbook about what content is working and what doesn't. And this is very similar to some of the things you saw earlier that Kraft put up. Uh, all of, a lot of us are, are kind of putting up a lot of test and learn, really understanding what content is resonating the most, and then sharing that information out. And we'll talk a little bit about how to create your own Pinterest playbook um, in the next few minutes. All right, so organic pin management, somebody like Ahology, you could do this internally. 
This is really great for starting your Pinterest presence. You do have to have a lot of content. Uh, we found that we were pinning five to 10 times a day, and I'll give you some strategies for, for how you can maybe increase the content versus what you, think you, what you think you might have. There's also no problem with repeating pins about once a month, no problem. You can repeat pins, new people see them, nobody gets tired of them. It's not quite the same as, as any of the other channels where, where there might be some wear out there. Um, the, the only real watch out with this is as promoted pins come out, and I think this morning they, they really kind of announced their big um, you know, test group, which ConAgra is not part of because it's a little pricey for us. Um, we, we feel like we're hoping Pinterest doesn't end up going down the same path as Facebook, which is really kind of turned into this all paid media type of platform and not giving enough real estate to the organic pins. So I think it'll be really interesting to watch over the next year. Do the promoted pins, uh, do the prices come down? Are they starting to take over the screen? What's the uh, consumer reaction to that? So that's really something to watch out for on Pinterest and, and stay close as those test uh, brands get started. All right, so that's it for the boring case studies. Um, let's talk a little bit about content. So here's uh, five kind of key strategies for getting your content revved up on Pinterest. I'm going to talk about each one of these and give some examples of what we've done. And the very first thing, always start with insights and data. Uh, and so for us, recipes are our content. So it's really about uh, a lot of the things that Dana was talking about, understanding the environment, the trends, that what's coming on, on um, for recipes, not just in Pinterest, but also on your own site and with uh, search. So some of the types of data that we have, and I actually have a little, little example here. Um, we use a lot, of, a lot of our own analytics data, so we take a look at Google Analytics to say what are the recipes that people are viewing and printing and what aren't they viewing and printing, uh, what should we be doing more of, what should we be doing less of, what keywords are people typing into the search box on our site and maybe yielding no results, because that's a pretty good indicator of what people are looking for. Um, we also use the Google uh, Food Index, which is a, a big study that comes out from Google that takes a look at top recipe keywords by week of the year. Um, and we've actually developed this tool for the rest of our team, all of our shopper field teams, that kind of gives them a month-by-month -month look at the key recipes. Because one of our jobs is providing tools for content planning, uh, not just doing it internally. So there's a lot of great resources that are free out there. Google Trends is an amazing source. You can, you can type in keywords and kind of pit them against each other. Up there, I've got taco recipe versus guacamole recipe. It gives you the, the peaks and valleys of when they make sense during the year, as well as understanding which terms may be more, um, more engaging to consumers. So uh, we, we basically take all that data, and we start to put together our recipe development calendar. Our test kitchen goes in, into the kitchen, develops concepts, does recipes. They test them again. They put them into our, into our system, and we do photography. And photography is something that I say probably didn't matter as much before Pinterest as it does now. Um, the visual web is all about photography. Uh, so three years ago when I started at ConAgra, we were really digging into the SEO nature of how do we optimize our content. You guys have heard a lot about that today. Um, we want to make sure our metadata is good. We have to put the Google recipe snippet, which is a piece of code, into our site. We develop landing pages based on the most, uh, the most searched consumer terms, like chicken recipes and meatloaf recipes. And all of those things have really led to a lot of success for search. We even work with our, our search agency, Rise, and there's a couple of them here today. Every time we make a new recipe, we send that recipe to our search agency and say, what should we name this to get the most traffic for our site? Um, now, with Pinterest, we still have to do all that, but we also need to worry about what does it look like. With search, not so visual. People come in, then they see the picture. Pinterest, you better, you better have a damn good picture for them to even bother to come to your site or pin it. So I, I took a look in the vault. I'm a little embarrassed to show this. Um, but here are some of the photos we were taking about three to four years ago. Um, not exactly appetizing, not exactly pin worthy. We've really stepped up the game. And here, oh, oh, you only get to see it for like one second. Um, here are some of the photos that we're, we're taking now. And a lot of this has changed specifically because of Pinterest. Obviously, other social channels benefit as well. But for Pinterest, being the, the visual nature, it's less social. It's more of a curator spot. Um, this, this is really forcing us to, to step up our visuals. Uh, but you don't have to go take all new photography. 
I don't have a huge photography budget. I bet most of you guys don't either, and you're working with a lot of assets that you maybe already have. So there's some tricks that we can try that really help with that as well. So cropping. Um, this is a, a test we ran on, on Pinterest, and I'm really a big fan of A-B tests. Just put one thing out there, put the other out there, see which performs better, and really start to capitalize on that knowledge. So this is one of our savory skillet lasagnas. By the way, skillet recipes, like one of the most popular types of dishes that everyone is always looking for because they want something delicious, but they don't want like the difficulty of making a big, long lasagna. They want it in a skillet. Um, so we, we put up the one on the left, and then we put up the one on the right, where we really just cropped in closer, didn't really do anything else. Um, the overlays we've tested, and those didn't, didn't make a huge impact. But uh, just cropping it increased the, the repins by 11 times. So that was a, a huge aha for us. Uh, we started doing that with a lot of our other content. And this isn't something that I, I, I don't think this is exclusive to recipes or food. This should work for, for any type of content. Um, and, and vertical. I think probably most of you know this, but Pinterest reformats all images that are posted into 156 pixels. So uh, the taller images do a little bit better. They get more real estate. They're able be, to be seen. You can see the, the photo on the left is the full photo, and it got squashed into a pretty small rectangle. And uh, we just took a little slice of the one on, on, on the bottom there, and you can see how much more space it's getting. And it really does increase your increase your engagement, increase your pins, and increase the traffic that you're seeing. Treat it like SEO. So let's talk about Pinterest in terms of SEO. Um, what that means is your pin descriptions need to be written in consumer language. Uh, that's really, really important because that's what people are using when they search. And, and when we talk a little bit about the differences between Pinterest versus search, I think with Pinterest, people are a little bit less specific of a search. So one of our top search terms that drives traffic from Google is Parmesan crusted tilapia. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really unlikely to go to Pinterest and search for specific recipes. So what you want to probably turn that into in your pin description is fish recipes or seafood recipes or healthy spring recipes, all of those things that your data has told you people are looking for. The other thing they do is use a little bit more um, adjectives to describe what they're looking for, especially around holidays. So I'm looking for cute Easter recipes or fun Halloween treats. And just some of those words, if you think about how people are searching, putting those in your pin description is going to give you a lot more likelihood to get shown up on somebody's Pinterest feed. And this is hopefully a no duh, um, but I feel like I need to say it. We need to make sure our content is viewable across devices. We need to have mobile sites. We need to be um, available screen agnostic content because the, the majority of our traffic from Pinterest is coming from mobile phones. So if you don't have a mobile optimized destination when they get there, forget it. They're going to bounce. They're out of there. They're probably not coming back. Um, and, and responsive design is, is one way that's really inefficient or really efficient. Strike that from the record. Um, <laughs> Responsive design is a way to get there efficiently because it's one set of code for your website that retrofits itself based on what screen they're using. Uh, and as we know, mobile, mobile phones and tablets are coming in all shapes and sizes, so it's a lot better to have that one set of code that kind of reorganizes itself based on what screen you're using than the kind of uh, old school way of having a desktop site and a mobile site. So, so all of our brand sites are trying to get there in the next year or two uh, budget permitting, and I, I definitely recommend that if you're going to go out on Pinterest, that the very first thing you should do is make sure your content's viewable on mobile. So we want to talk about how do we make our content work hard. So I mentioned five to ten pins a day. That's a lot. Um, you can get through 600 recipes in two months that way. Um, and I don't have a whole lot more than that. So what are we going to do about that? Well, so this is one of my favorite new recipes. It's a grilled shrimp taco recipe. Has a little salsa made with rotel, avocado, corn. Pretty good. Check it out. Um, well, some of the some ideas on maybe how you can expand what what this could be into multiple pins would be taking a couple of different photos. So maybe when you go to your photographer, if you if you are doing new photography, take a couple of different shots, prop it differently, angle it differently. That's not going to cost you three times as much if you do it all at once. Step by step. People really like to know how to do things. So we're finding a lot of success with step-by-step with -step photos. Uh, we're just starting to test these, um, but I think we'll, we'll be doing this a lot more in the coming year and really kind of understanding how they work. And then grouping recipes, so linking to collections of information um, and figuring out uh, different ways to, to frame that. So that grilled shrimp recipe, 
It might show up in the shrimp recipes, it might show up in grilling recipes, and voila, you know, we've turned one piece of content into five or six pieces of content without a whole lot of extra um, creative costs. So the last thing I have to say really is to, to adopt a testing mentality. Test and test and test and test again. Pinterest is great for this. It is extremely uh, inexpensive to, to test on Pinterest, and you really just have to get your, your juices flowing on what are the different variables that you can test, what are the, what are the things you want to learn to create your playbook. So that could be um, text overlays. What type of text do you want to put out there? Is that helping or is that hurting? Um, different crops, linking to different formats of content. And some of these were things that we saw didn't work, like putting the number of ingredients, even though that's part of our equity. On Pinterest, that wasn't something people were interested in. And I don't know if that's because it's a little bit more aspirational, or if that's like the fourth piece of, piece of information they want to know besides the recipe title. Um, but, but that didn't work for us. It might work for you, didn't work for us. And you want to really start to create your playbook. So kind of start that running list of like, what works? What doesn't work? What time should I be pinning what content? So we found out that pinning desserts in the evening works a lot better than pinning them in the morning. Maybe that's intuitive. Maybe it's not something we wrote down and tested. We actually are finding that salad recipes don't work that well. And one of the hypotheses is because people don't feel like they need to, to know how to make the recipe. And remember, for us, that traffic to our site with the branded ingredients is our KPI. So just having somebody pin, not so helpful to us. It needs to be driving traffic. Um, there's a lot of other things. This goes on and on, and we're continually iterating it. Um, but I really recommend you guys sort of sitting down, doing a content brainstorm to say, what content do we have? How can we test this? And then really just start testing it, put it out there, and understand what's driving higher engagement, and then focus in on that type of content as you move forward. I think that's about all I have. There we go.